So I got everything you need to know about the NCAA finally agreeing to pay the players. But it's a little more complicated than that. But that's why I'm here to make it simple. So first, I'll give you the background. The NCAA has been paying players for since its inception under the guise of amateurism. They summarize amateurism as a student athlete should not be rewarded or allowed to accept financials for their athletic talents because that would affect their amateurism. They define amateurism as the practice of an activity, especially a sport, on an unpaid rather than a professional basis. So basically, their reasoning this whole time has been, so why aren't they paid? Because they're amateurs. Well, why are they amateurs? Because they're not paid. It's been flimsy from the beginning, but they've been able to get this off for a literal century. That was until the NIL lawsuit from 2021, where they finally admitted after being taken to the Supreme Court, fine, we won't stop other people from paying you anymore. Very important distinction. The NCAA still was never paying players. And for whatever reason, people thought NIL payments were coming from the schools directly. That was never true. It may have come from collectives that are alumni of the school, which is a whole separate conversation. But no, the schools were never directly paying the players. That might have changed this week, though. So in a nutshell, the settlement payment y'all keep hearing about the $2.77 billion is a result of three lawsuits. House versus NCAA, Hubbard versus NCAA, and Carter versus NCAA. Three former athletes, all represented by Jeffrey Kessler and Steve Berman. Jeffrey Kessler is a well-renowned athlete's right lawyer. Uh, he headed the lawsuit that started free agency in the NFL almost three decades ago, so he's been in this for a while. So, in summary, Jeffrey Kessler suing sports leagues is what he does, right? It's in his blood. So the NCAA's board of directors and the Power Five conferences have agreed to the $2.77 billion settlement. That would include back pay to both current student athletes and former student athletes dating all the way back to 2016. That's across all division one sports. Along with back pay though, starting in fall of 2025, this settlement opens the door for revenue sharing between the schools and the students. This is the interesting part. Athletes can be paid directly for their universities now. This is separate from NIL, which never came from the schools. This is a direct quote. I don't like messing this one up. So as a part of the revenue sharing agreements, student athletes will receive an estimated 22% or roughly 20 million of the average power five schools, media rights, sponsorship, and ticket sales. So that seems simple enough, right? Open and shut case, athletes are getting paid, people are getting back paid. Let's move on, right? Mm, pump your brakes. Let's dig a little deeper. The plaintiffs, have not agreed to the settlement yet and the judge presiding the case has not approved this settlement yet you're probably wondering why take the money they agreed not so fast if they take this settlement athletes can no longer sue the ncaa even if they're not included in the 2016 time frame now i want you to think about all the iconic pre-2016 teams the Fat Five of Michigan, Johnny Manziel, Texas a and teams, the 2001 Miami Hurricanes, just to name a few. Also, the NCAA stands to lose 10 times that much. I'm not even exaggerating. 10 times that much if they go to trial. That might even be lowballing it because the NCAA was founded in 1906 and they haven't been paying players for the entire time. So we're talking almost 120 years of not paying players at all. So if the back pay has to go back that far, the NCAA is just gonna go bankrupt. And no more NCAA, they're gonna have to form a new collegiate sports league some way, somehow. Cause there will be college sports, it just won't be under the NCAA. Which is another one of the main reasons why this agreement hasn't been settled yet. Other cases are still ongoing that aren't these three that are represented by other legal teams. I believe the name is Fontenot versus the NCAA. And their legal team's like, yo, what the, no, y'all are undercutting us. And they think that that settlement is actually lowballing the athletes. And I completely agree. 2016 just feels arbitrary. And also, also, I, I'm no lawyer. Just a little bit of legal advice, if I can, just a little bit. If you're suing somebody and they accept your first settlement offer that quickly, it means one of three things. One, they're guilty as f Two, they want to avoid discovery at 
all cost or three you have severely lowballed yourself also that settlement doesn't define student athletes as employees so they'd still have to fight for unionization health care plans pensions 401ks blah 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 and the ncaa would rather deal with it later they're just worried about not getting sued don't get it confused this settlement and ncaa agreeing to pay this has nothing to do with them wanting to do right by the players they're tired of getting sued on one hand because they can't keep living like this popping up at the supreme court and losing these lawsuits because they've been losing every single one of them and the other part of it is they're sick of these coaches and complaining to them about how nil is ruining the sport and all of their iconic coaches are leaving and a lot of them are blaming the nil landscape the ncaa don't like that and especially if discovery starts to come out and we start seeing these books publicly for the past hundred years how much these athletes are really getting screwed although some of this is public you can actually see how much uh revenue that the ncaa earned last year it was uh 1.3 billion dollars by the way that's just 2022 to 2023 multiply that by 100 and divide that in half because the players are mostly responsible because ain't nobody showing up to see these stuffy old dudes in suits we showing up to see some sports same-minded people would be outraged if they saw how much money these athletes are really being cheated out of all these years the key word there though is sane minded because i know most college football fans which i'm assuming you are if you're still watching or listening at this point most not all tend to be rational people because a lot of them have been drinking this amateurism kool-aid for decades now and if you're one of those people that are concerned that the quote unquote purity of the game is going to disappear if players getting paid bothers you so much i have three questions First, do you watch professional sports? Two, does it bother you that they get paid for essentially doing the same thing? If you haven't noticed your own hypocrisy by now, how long have you been a loser? Now for the sane-minded fans, here's how it's gonna affect you. A lot of you are gonna hear this. We're gonna have to cut insert non-profit generating sport here so olympic sport let's say track and field or swimming those don't produce at the same level as basketball football or even baseball schools, lacrosse whatever due to new payment rules we can't afford to keep those in line which is them telling on themselves because the wages they've been stealing from the football players and basketball players have been supporting all the other sports another thing you're going to hear is we now have to increase payment prices and ticket prices and merch prices, even though they're already been taxing y'all on merch and tickets, due to the new payment rules. First off, if your favorite school blames the new payment rules for anything, look up your athletic director and the president of the school's salaries and see if they took a pay cut, because I promise you they didn't. They would just much rather that the athletes or you take the hit as opposed to them. And the we have to cut other sports things is nonsense. Division two schools, division three schools, NAIA, JUCO sports, have been running for as long as the NCAA has been in existence and don't man one of them produce a profit. Not a one. I would know I played division three football. Our stadiums were packed. We still weren't generating. So these schools saying they can't afford to run these sports without revenues is a flat out lie. But for now, that's all we know. Anything else that I would say at this point would just be pure speculation and i don't want to do that but this is far from over it's far from being a done deal so many parties still have to agree there's other lawsuits pending against the ncaa especially if the 2016 is going to be the cutoff line because if i'm jalen rose chris weber and anyone associated with the fat five teams i'm contacting my legal team right now if 2016 is your if they're finally admitting their revenue sharing and we've been doing this wrong and y'all think you're gonna stop at 2016 when we were the most famous college basketball team in the world for two years? Oh, hell no. Oh, no. Y'all owe me money. But that concludes today's episode of the Kev BK Beloved Show. I've been Kev BK Beloved. Thank you so much for listening. That was so corny. I'm sorry. <laughs>